Welcome to Gurus on the Spot, bringing you nuggets of well-being from the Indian wisdom traditions. I'm Veena Rampal, classical Indian dancer and spiritual coach. Yeah, you look absolutely <laughs> great. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So, Eka, the first thing I want to know is how did you come to be so wonderfully immersed in sacred Indian art? I was looking for somatic, whole body, breathing techniques and stretching, relaxing, embodiment techniques. And so I started going to yoga classes. And I was like, this is brilliant. How does this work? And so I went looking around for somebody who could answer all of my crazy questions about yoga. And I finally found a guru. I took initiation with this guru. He answered a bunch of my questions. And of course, I had a bunch more. And in part of uh, practicing that, I, he said, you know, I took initiation. I got this weird name. I didn't want anything to do with all these strange Hindu deities and statues and bowing on the ground and all that weird stuff that was like too far out for me. But I couldn't argue with the results I was getting from doing the yogic practices. And so I said, I'm going to suspend disbelief. I'm just going to like follow orders. And he told me to do prostrations. I'm like, okay, there's some brass statue. I'm going to prostrate on the ground in front of the statue of Shiva. Okay, whatever. Hut, hut, I'm just going to obey orders and just do the thing, right? One of the things he said, he said, where's your picture of Ma? Hmm. I've been initiated into the sadhana for Kali. And I said, what do you mean? We were just out, oh, a bunch of us in a restaurant. He goes, where's your picture? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, don't you have a picture of your sweetheart in your wallet? I was like, <laughs> And so I went looking for a picture of Kali and none of them looked right. I'd been meditating for her for a couple of years at that point and I'd had really intense visions of her and she never looked like the pictures you typically see where she's like, ah, looking all crazy and all that. <laughs> she was very loving and beautiful. So I finally, um, I kept hearing this whisper in my ears. It's like, well, you could draw me. Wow. Why don't you just make a picture of what you see? Like put that in your wallet, draw the picture, you could draw me. And I kept saying, not worthy, not worthy. I don't know that. Oh, it's so complicated, all this iconography. You could draw me. I finally found a picture from Bengal where she's very benevolent, Dakshina Kali, right, from Dakina Shwar. Um, and she looks very sweet. She's, you know, looks very happy. She's got a little tongue sticking out, just sitting there looking blissed out. It was pretty good. And I still have, I don't have my wallet on me, but I still have that picture in my wallet. I laminated it. But I still kept getting these little whispers, you could draw me. Mm. And so finally, I compiled everything that I knew. I was having this very extraordinary experience of, of Ma, and um, I didn't really understand it. But I cobbled together things from lots of different sources. I took a couple of classes with a Nepalese art teacher, and I drew the picture. And it turns out that the goddess I was drawing was not the Bengali Kali, it was Paravak. So Kali in her creative mode. The Kashmiris consider that to be Kali as the creatrix rather than mm -hmm. as the destroyer, because of course she's both, you know, she's time. And um, I posted that picture on Facebook, and um, it was the first picture of a deity I'd drawn. I was just in such a mood, I got it done in six hours. I just did it all at one time, and a scholar saw it. And he said, where did you find that picture? <laughs> I drew it. And he goes, how could you have drawn that? And I said, well, that's what I saw in my visions. And he goes, well, that's Goddess Pradavak. And I said, yeah, I kind of figured that that must be her. And he's like, I want you to illustrate my book. Wow. And so I got the gig to illustrate Tantra Illuminated, which was my first major gig. And um, it started a whole new career for me in making sacred art. It was a, a baptism by fire. He wanted me to recreate the images of, of all of these deities from all of the tantric lineages, all the great sampradayas. But he wanted me to draw them in ninth century style, so historical <laughs> style. So I, I just immediately, this is, this is Ma, when you're a devotee, like when she gets you, it's like just, <laughs> she gets shit. And so I just spent months doing research, going to all the university libraries. I live in Berkeley, so I was at the Berkeley University Library. I went to San Francisco, the Asian Art Museum. And I did all of this research and I just like all this knowledge and all this practicing. And I was also afraid I might make any mistakes. And that book has become a classic and people still buying it. And that first image, that first image I drew is now on altars of people around the world. It blows my mind. I can't believe it. It was transmission. It was Ma working through me. I'm, I'm blessed. It was transmission. That, that is absolutely clear when you speak about it. I mean, it happened to you and through you and with you and for you. You didn't make it happen, right? No. 
Amazing. Okay, so with that power, let's yeah. move straight into talking about yantra. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really interested in yantra. So what is it that makes a yantra powerful? Because it's very easy, I think, for people to look at a yantra and think, oh, well, it's just geometric patterns. But actually, yantra is an incredibly powerful machine. So mm -hmm. what is it that makes a yantra powerful? So I'm going to give you the tricky answer, and then I'll explain. Nothing. Yeah. It has no power. <laughs> Nothing. There's no power in it at all. It's a device. Does a, a car have any power if there's no gasoline in it? Does a chainsaw no. have any power if it's got no, no, if it hasn't been turned on? Mm -hmm. It's just a piece of metal until you bring your attention and your devotion, your love and your respect for the deity until you invoke the mantra into it. It's just a, it's just a vessel. It's just a copper pot. It's just a piece of gold metal with some lines drawn on it. It has no power in it until you bring your shakti, your attention, your energy, and the mantra until it's imbued with the energy of the deity. Now, when we look at a murti, a statue of a deity, or we look at a yantra, and we're like, oh, that's a yantra for Durga. And then we bring up our excitement, and we're like, oh, wow, that is a yantra for Durga. And we bring our excitement and our energy and our attention to it. It comes alive in our awareness. And that's the power of it. The yantra exists inside of you. The, the piece of metal with some lines drawn on it or the painting with colors on it, that's just ink on paper. That's just lines on a piece of metal. It's really our awareness. It's our excitement, our joy, our love, and our devotion that brings the power to it. It is a device, like you said, it's a very powerful device, but it can do nothing until Shakti and Shiva, you know, it's, it's a piece of metal, it's just Shiva until you bring the Shakti to it. And your love and your devotion is the Shakti. That's what fills it. It's a container. It's a pattern of lines that contains your attention. And when you bring your love and attention, it becomes powerful. So if, if somebody didn't know anything about yantras, if they didn't know to identify that's a Durga yantra, for example, yeah. would, are you saying that the yantra wouldn't have any effect? Oh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> tricky, tricky. So um, if I don't know what a car is, does it still have an effect? So it depends. Is somebody else driving it? It right. might not have gas in the gas tank, but if I take the brakes off, it starts rolling downhill. You know, it, it does have a presence. So I'd say, especially a ritual object, if it has been what they call prana prashishta, if the deity has been installed in it, if people have used it for ritual, I don't ever recommend touching ritual objects if you don't know who has been using it. Right? You don't, it might have all kinds of spiritual germs on it. You don't know. It could be blessing. It might be very powerful. But if you don't know how to use it, like a chainsaw or something, you know, people could get hurt. So does the yantra itself have power? If it's been imbued with power, if you recognize it and you bring your power and your love and devotion to it, for sure. If you don't know what it is, you're just some ignorant fool, you see a piece of paper with a bunch of geometric things drawn on it, no, it's not going to have any power for you. It's just a piece of paper with lines on it. But that doesn't mean we should disrespect other people's ritual objects, because who knows, someday you might be coaching poets and get a guru and then have to start learning sacred art. And if you've created a, a bias in your system that you think all this stuff is just junk, that becomes an impediment, a samskara, that mm -hmm. keeps you from doing your practice, right? It, it actually is a negative karma that, that can inhibit your ability to recognize divinity in form. You're such a wonderful teacher, Ika, honestly. And, and I think this is what I recognized in you from when I first came, came across you and your work. Um, so I, and I want to underscore the point you made about not messing with other people's ritual objects, because I, I remember, um, years ago when I was living in India, um, in my gap year, I was very much warned off yantras by a yogi who was saying, you do not want to mess with that, especially, you, you know, don't touch other people's yantras, but precisely because of what you've just said. Um, and I like your term spiritual germs. Um, and the, <laughs> but, but also it could go further. I mean, I think that 
people don't necessarily realize that these things are about power. It's not just about love and devotion. And the yeah. thing about power is that it can be used positively or it can be used very destructively. Yeah. So, so on that note, my next question is about yan a yantra being essentially a tantric technology. So I want to ask you another huge question, if you could just answer it in a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. From the perspective of Yantra, what is Tantra? Oh, okay. From the perspective of Yantra. So Yantra, the word Yantra uh, means device. And one way to break that down, one teaching method, one, my, one of my teacher's teachers said, it's the combination of Yam and Trana. Yam meaning to hold or to, to contain. And Trana, like it's expansion, like energy expansion container. Um, people explain, explain it different ways, but it's like a container of enlightenment. It's an enlightenment device. It's the way he explained it. Um, so if we're looking at a yantra and we're looking at this device, you see a car and you're like, oh, and it's, it's sitting there and it's running. And you're like, what is this thing? The, the, the tantra, tantra literally is a text. It's the owner's manual. It's the instruction manual. It tells you how to drive it. The Tantra is all of the techniques and the um, practices and the awarenesses to have so that you can use this device. So if you encountered a living Yantra that's been used in ritual and somebody's like, no, this enlightened master, it's perfectly cool. It's like seeing a car with the keys in it and it's running. Do you know how to drive it? You might hurt yourself, you might hurt other people if you just get in and try and drive it. Do you know how to drive a stick shift? Is it an automatic or a stick shift? How do you even know? Mm -hmm. So the Tantra is the instruction manual. Now we can talk about the Tantric tradition as a whole and people's biases about Tantra, but literally I just feel like people need to be reminded, Tantra is a text. It is an instruction manual. Most Tantras actually have step-by-step -step procedures for doing spiritual practices. That's what most Tantras are. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. You make yantras, you paint beautiful yantras. If, if someone wanted to commission you to create a yantra, especially for them, how would they go about choosing the right one for them? Oh my goodness, that's like the hardest question. <laughs> you can choose on the basis of what you want to accomplish, like the purpose. You, you want to make a device for a purpose. You can do that. But we need to remember that most yantras are related to deities. The deity is like the operating principle. It's the intelligence of the machine. And then when you say, I want to work with a certain deity to get a certain effect. Now you're saying, I want a relationship with the divine intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying, I want a relationship. Now it could be strictly transactional. I'm just going to go. I'm going to do some things. This person's going to help me out. We're done. Peace out. See you later. <laughs> Um, but generally speaking, because they're divine intelligence, we're getting in a relationship. And to say, like, when people say, which yantra should I get? Usually they're using it for realization. They're putting it on their altar. And then, like, one of my teachers said, she goes, don't bring the murti or the statue or the yantra into your home without knowing who it is. That's like having a roommate. Would you get a new roommate without Googling them first? <laughs> You have some random good looking person off the corner in India and say, come home with me. You don't even know their name. You don't speak the same language. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah. So we need to understand that when we choose the yantra, we're not just choosing it for a purpose. We're also cultivating a relationship and we're cultivating a relationship with the divine intelligence that has been imbued or invoked into that device. And I would never recommend bringing a yantra home unless you knew who your new roommate is. So I think the first place to start, I think the safe answer for the public is, find out who you're talking to, who you're asking for help, build a relationship with them before you ask them to move in. <laughs> Does that make sense? Brilliant, brilliant answer. This is so good because you, you're really addressing uh, the yantra technology from a very high level and explaining it in a way that's really accessible to people. So I, because I think I this question all the time and they're essentially asking me to assign them a roommate or they're, right. they're trying to ask me to assign them a spouse. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the relationship piece is so important that, that when people start to 
to use a yantra, it is about coming into relationship with the divine energy. And that, and like any relationship, it's a two way thing, right? It's reciprocal. You Absolutely. cannot, yeah, so you can, yes, you can be transactional about it, but you do have to be really clear. And I think clarity is absolutely paramount here because that's where people can really um, make, make big mistakes. Well, I think one of the biggest mistakes we see, I'm a white guy and I'm making yantras. And like I was just this morning, I taught a class this morning with my student uh, Pooja in Mumbai. I'm now a white guy making Hindu art, teaching Indian people about uh, Tantra. And I need to be careful about things like appropriation and colonialism and racism and how these things work in a very complex dynamic. And, and so many people get so upset about these ideas of appropriation and who's authorized, who has the, the word for competence, like who's authorized oh, to teach. Adhikara. Adhikara, thank you. Yeah. So, um, I think a lot of this can be boiled down to a lot of the problems that we see of white people teaching indigenous Hindu traditions out of context is a lack of relationship. And that comes down to, it looks like a lack of respect, but they're not actually in love with the things they're teaching. They're not actually in relationship with the principles that they're invoking. They don't have Indian Hindu friends. They're not building a relationship with the deity and using those powers in a loving and respectful manner like you would if you asked a friend that you love for help. So you're talking to your roommate, who's a divine, powerful being, and saying, can you teach me how to drive this car? It's gonna be very different than if you're just like stealing a car out of somebody else's yard, jumping into it and smashing it into things as you're learning how to drive. Yeah. All kinds of problems arise. Absolutely. So is there anything available on your website that people can go and look at to find out a little bit more about yantras? I would encourage people to visit livingsanskrit.com. Livingsanskrit.com is where I teach my online classes and we've got lots of free videos and classes there. I'd also encourage people to check out my two books, the Shakti Coloring Book and the Bhakti Coloring Book. And they sound like kids books, but I'm telling you, I worked with 12 different Sanskrit scholars on my first book. I did tons of research. The information has been approved by a lot of high powered practitioners who use it as a teaching manual. It sounds like a kid's book, but there's actually a lot of information in there and a lot of secrets that I don't say are secrets, but are kind of just kind of gently put there as if I'm talking to kids. So um, there's actually a lot of information in the Shakti comic book specifically. Amazing. Eka, thank you so much for joining me for Gurus on the Spot. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.